Welcome to the Supplement Engineer Podcast. My name is Robert Chinetsky. Today, we have a very special guest joining the show. He's a well-respected health and fitness coach, a best-selling author, and the founder of Legion Athletics and Muscle for Life, Mr. Mike Matthews. Uh, welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate you having me on. Uh, now, I know you, you've recanted the history of Muscle for Life, and you've been around the industry for a long time. Um, can you briefly recap why you decided to start Legion in the first place? Because obviously, you were already successful with, with your writings and with the content you were producing on Muscle for Life. So why step into the chaotic frenzy that is the supplement industry? You know, Lamborghinis and Rolexes, duh. <laughs> Living the lifestyle. <laughs> the the four-hour work week, you know what I mean? Um, no, it really actually, it, it's actually kind of annoying because the what I'm going to tell you now is what everybody says. And when I started Legion, this is year six, and so when I started Legion, it, it was it was a bit unique in that this is not what everybody was saying. And even then that 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 uh, also uh, it also applies to the terminology that I use on or just the phraseology, I guess, on Legion's website and how I have pitched the brand and positioned the brand. And I understand. I mean, that's how markets work. People see something works and they go, I'll just copy and paste that. Um, and so I'm, I'm going through and we can get into that after if you want to know more about it. I'm going into I'm getting into a whole. Uh, well, I'm rebranding and redesigning everything. I'm not doing it myself. I'm working with a firm and also going to be uh, raising the bar uh, as to what it really means to be a science-based supplement company. But to answer your question, so back uh, – again, this is year six. So year one was 2014. So in 2013, um, I had a few books that were selling well. I had a website called Muscle for Life, which was very popular. I want to say at this point, it was probably close to seven or 800,000 visits a month. And I was getting asked a lot about supplements, what supplements are good, what supplements are bad, what supplements do I personally use? And I had some recommendations up uh, at Muscle for Life of the stuff I was using at the time. And my recommendations were really lukewarm because I wasn't particularly excited about any of them, right? So I, I was using at the time Optum Nutrition's gold standard way. And I was like, you know, this stuff has passed a lot of third party um, analyses and I trust that it has the protein that they say it has and it's not amino spiked and uh, it doesn't taste very good. And, but hey, whatever, it's cheap and it's reliable. And for a pre-workout, I was using ONS pre-workout at the time. And I was like, you know, I don't like coffee. At the time, I didn't like coffee. Um, and sometimes I just do like a caffeine pill instead of this, but it does, I think at the time it had four grams of citrulline and maybe two grams of beta alanine per serving. And I was like, yeah, it's not very good, but maybe it's better than nothing. And if I liked coffee, I probably would just drink coffee and not even waste the caffeine on, on, a pre-workout like this. And there were a couple other supplements I was using with the same type of, you know, Hey, this isn't very good, but this is the best I could find. And, uh, still a lot of people though, were buying those products based on my recommendations. And I knew that because I was linking out to Amazon and I was participating in their affiliate program. Not so much to, it never made a ton of money, but it was, uh, I was just more curious, like if people were actually going to buy things based on what I was recommending and in what quantity, like how, how, how many purchases were, were there coming off of these recommendations. So with those recommendations living on the website and also living in the bonus material that came with the books, which many people downloaded and checked out, I saw that quite a few people were actually buying these products. And so then I, of course, had the idea what if I were to make my own products, make the stuff that I wish someone else were making? And if they were making, I would just reach out to them. Like if Legion would have already existed uh, back in 2013, I may not have even done it. I may just have reached out to that company and been like, hey, uh, you're basically doing exactly what I want. And I would love to promote you. And here's how I can promote you. I can promote you in my books. I can promote you to my email lists. I can promote you on social media, on my website, blah, 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 and put together a deal. And in some ways, that is it, – it, it would have been preferable, especially starting out, because I had a lot to offer. So so let's just say that I could have made a, a deal that would be worth, I don't know, $50,000 a month, let's say. And that wouldn't be out of the question, actually, at that uh, even at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and 
uh, and I go, okay, that, that's what it would be worth. That, that's what I could make if I just went and worked with this other company. Um, what would it take though to, to create a business that could, that could make me $50,000 a month? And, uh, what many people who, if they haven't been in business for themselves, what, what they, they don't, uh, know to ask about is they'll hear big sales numbers, you know, hear, hear about big revenue numbers. But really what matters is the bottom line is the, but is the profit, how much is left at the end of the day. And so, um, in order to, to make $50,000. So for example, if you're, if your business is turning a 10% profit, which is okay, that's not great, but that's not bad. Then that's, Five hundred thousand dollars a month in sales. You actually have to sell a lot of stuff yeah. <laughs> to, to even to even create fifty thousand dollars in profit. And you can't just as an owner take all of the profit out of your business. You have to also reinvest, continue to grow it. So let's now bump it up. Let's say it's probably more like seventy to eighty thousand a month in in or sorry seven hundred to eight hundred thousand a month in sales to to to, to create fifty thousand dollars of profit left over for for the owner and still be able to reinvest in the business, launch new products, try new marketing and advertising things, whatever. Right. So, you know, I've had this talk with a, with a number of people in the, in the industry who have, who have a following who are in maybe a similar position as I was when I started Legion and thinking about getting into supplements. And, um, I, you know, I, this is just something that I've laid out for a number of people and they're like, yeah, I never thought about it. Like thought it like that. So I'm like, I'm not saying don't get into supplements, but you know, think, think about what, uh, cause now you also have a business that you have to run too, and a business that's a pain in the ass <laughs> and it, it is, and you have inventory to manage. You're going to have employees to manage. You are, there's a lot of extra work and just, uh, headaches that come with that. Whereas being, um, sponsored by a company is very simple anyway. So that, that company didn't exist though at the time. So I was like, all right, I'm going to do it myself. And, uh, I knew that I didn't know where it was going to go ultimately, but I knew that I wouldn't get stuck with the, the initial run. I think we bought, I think we ordered like 80 to a hundred thousand dollars of stuff. That was our first order. And I knew just based on what I had seen through Amazon, you know, affiliate links, basically that, um, I wasn't going to have any problem selling that initial run. I didn't know if it was going to become like a really viable and thriving business, but it seemed like a pretty low risk proposition, uh, all things considered. And so I did it and it went quite well. We, we sold out of our, of all that stuff fairly quickly and, uh, didn't, didn't place reorders soon enough. So just sat there out of stock for a bit and did that, you know, that was kind of, we were in and out of stock for the first year, but we still did 1.1 million in sales that first year. Um, wow. and yeah. So, so, you know, if we would have done a better job managing inventory, we probably could have done two or three times that honestly. Um, and if I now fast forward to today, uh, Legion will do about 20 million in sales this year. And if knowing what I know now, if I could have went back to that year two and just made some, some key changes, um, uh, some personnel changes, mostly actually, I, I think the business would be double its current size just because there still is a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I got into it. And that's why I got into it. Uh, did any of your previous experience with building up muscle for life, uh, translate and help you get Legion running off the ground or was it two completely different animals that you were trying to tame? Eh, it was very different because Muscle for Life at that time was really just a glorified blog. It was just something that I posted a couple article to uh, articles to every week, and collected emails and emailed the articles out and uh, just stayed in touch with people. And it, it grew through SEO and word of mouth and in social media at the time. It was a lot easier to, for example, get a bunch of traffic from Facebook. Uh, that's 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 very hard now. Whereas that back then it was it was you got a lot more organic reach back then. Now it's much more pay to pay, pay to play. So the only the only carryover was I started a blog over at Legion too, um, and uh, just took articles from Us for Life on, on topics. Uh, took the articles that did the best, and then created new articles on those topics for Legion, just, just cause I knew that if, if muscle for life could rank, uh, you know, really we're talking about the top, one of the top three, like number one, two or three for something like stubborn fat, then Legion probably could too. And so I just kind of repeated the process, 
uh, over at Legion that that helped get Muscle for Life to where it was at the time. And so beyond that, no, it was a it was a completely different business. And uh, it was just kind of like, you know, we'll figure it out uh, along the way kind of thing. <laughs> There's no books you can read on how, how do you start a supplement business? You can you can read plenty of books on how to start a business. And I, and I've and I have done that over the years. And uh, so I guess maybe I had a leg up in that regard, but I didn't have any specific experience from most for life where I could just say, you know, yeah, now, you know, for example, next year, I'm going to be launching another supplement company. It's going to be another line. It's going to be similar to Legion uh, in terms of its USP, in terms of its unique selling proposition, but it's going to be cheaper. It's going to be about half the price. Now, that means the products aren't going to be as good as Legion, but they're going to be good uh, and they're going to be much better than any anything else at that price point. And so now that's a very straightforward process. I've already done it with Legion. It's 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 copy and paste in a in a in a sense. We know exactly what we need to do to get it off the ground, but uh, that wasn't the case in the beginning with Legion. Did you have like an Obi One guiding you along the way when you were trying to vet out manufacturers? Because the, to the average consumer, the whole manufacturing side of the industry is a very like mysterious. You know, it's the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain kind of thing. Nobody understands what in the hell is going on in the supplement manufacturing from the consumer's point of view. Um, so, how did you become acquainted with that, and what challenges did you experience with vetting different manufacturers in the early stages of Legion? Yeah, you know, it, that was just a process of hitting Google and start uh, reaching out to companies and start speaking with um, people who, who run these companies. And we ended up, let's see, we started with a company we didn't like in, they were called Florida Supplements, I think. And they they just were disorganized and uh, they, they weren't good at flavoring. They were just not, not very good, uh, all around. And, um, and then from there we found someone who we did like, who just, he, I, I got a good feeling. Uh, his name's Peter, still friends with him today. And his company was, uh, was it, I think it was integrity. He ended up selling it and now it's, it's all under the, um, umbrella of capstone nutrition. Now is one of my manufacturers who work with several, but again, it was just a matter of like, okay, Stepping back for a second and and informing ourselves about CGMP practices and NSF NSF certification, what those things mean. Okay, what are some criteria that we want um, to uh, judge these these potential manufacturers by, and what do those things mean? And um, we got third party testing done, and we told manufacturers in the beginning we were going to get third party testing done for with who, who do we work with? Not Covance. We've used Covance. I'm trying to remember the name, uh, Eurofin. That's what it was. So we've worked with Eurofin a number of times and Eurofin's Eurofin, big, big international lab, as well as Covance, because one of the problems, one of the many problems you can run into with manufacturers is you're trying to make a good product and they are telling you they're delivering what you are ordering and they're not. They just leave out ingredients like there, uh, there, it wasn't any of the manufacturers that I named, but there was one who we were, uh, we were wanting to use as just a backup. Cause that's also anyone who's getting in the supplement industry. You're going to want, once things are up and running, make sure you have backup, at least one backup manufacturer who can, uh, um, produce ideally anything and everything. Um, at a, in case your main manufacturer runs into problems, we, we, we ran into that issue along the way, didn't have backups, lost a bunch, bunch of money, blah, blah, blah. So there was one company who, that, that we were considering for, uh, a backup and they ran a uh, triumph and I told them I was going to get it. Uh, I was going to send it off to Eurofins before even paying for it, it needed to be verified that it had exactly what it's supposed to have. They said, yeah, sure, no problem. And this company had all the certifications and their price was really good. So I was skeptical, uh, but I was like, <laughs> okay, I mean, I, I guess they, they, they know the terms of the agreement and, uh, it turned, they, they, they run, um, it was, it was a minimum order obviously, but they run a, a couple thousand bottles or whatever send three. We also did in triplicate testing just to make extra sure, send three off to Eurofins and it comes back mostly just vitamin C. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> what do you, what do you, 
what are you guys doing? I told you exactly what I'm going to do. Why, why waste your time and money and waste time? Like, and they, and then they, they were just trying to say that, that your offense is wrong. It's like, no, they tested three bottles. Like, um, no, just, oh, I don't know. Here, here are the COAs. Here's exactly what we did. No, that's not exactly what you did. Um, and so moved on. And so, you know, we've, we've gone through that, uh, a couple times, but fortunately we found our way to, to big reputable companies that we actually pay a premium to be with. We could be paying less for our stuff and we could use that considering how high our cost of goods is because it requires a high cogs. If you're going to make good products, if you're going to make, you know, if you're trying to keep your cost of goods at let's say 30% or so, which would probably be good by general business standards, mm -hmm. you're going to make shit products. You can't have, you can't have great margins and great products. <laughs> Pick one. Um, and so we pay a premium on, on our premium expensive formulations to work with some of the best and biggest manufacturers, uh, in the world actually. And it's, it's just worth it because I know now that even though we still get testing done, we're actually going to be doing a whole thing with lab door and we're going to be incorporating that into the website. But, um, I know now that I'm not getting screwed. I'm getting exactly what I am ordering, which of course means that my customers are getting exactly what they're ordering. And yeah, it's just, uh, I, under, I understand I've had a number of people reach out to me over the years asking like, how do I find a good manufacturer? And my honest answer to that though, is when people ask me that, I, I tell them, you probably shouldn't get into this game. You probably shouldn't start a supplement company if you are saying you don't even know how to find a good manufacturer because you really can just start on Google and start thinking about it and start working on it. And you're going to run into... This is like a very, this is a, a speed bump compared to all the obstacles you're going to run into. Um, and anyway, so yeah, that's a question I've been asked over the years a number of times. Is there any recourse for you as the brand owner when a manufacturer screws you over? Can you take them to court? Do they refund your money? You know, if they're confronted with the knowledge that they've screwed you over and you've got the proof to back it up, you know, do, do you have to threaten them with legal action in order to get your money back? Or is it, is it a sunk cost at that point and you're just SOL? I'm not sure. Fortunately, I had an agreement with that company who did that, or the company that did that. Basically, it was just clear. I didn't have to pay for it. I was like, no, I didn't even, I said, no, it's yours now. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is, it's that, you know, whatever, guys, I told you, like, this is, I, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, need the product. I was trying to set up a, another manufacturer just in case. Because then what you do is you just split your orders between your main manufacturers and your backups. Or if you only have one main and one backup, you might give 80% of your business to the main and 20% of the backup just to keep the account active in case things go wonky with your main and then you're not just sitting there without product. In this case, it was, again, we were just prospecting for a backup. So um, I, didn't have to, I didn't have to do anything there because that was the agreement and they didn't try to fight it themselves legally because they would have lost. There would have been, no, it would have, wouldn't have went anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but if one of my current manufacturers, which again, I know is not happening because I get testing done, but um, if it did happen, uh, they probably would be legally liable. I mean, they, yeah, they are agreeing to deliver exactly what is on the spec sheet. So there's, there has to be a legal liability there. Just fortunately, I haven't had to go down that road. Gotcha. Um, now, when you, st you started the brand, obviously, you're going to deliver the products that most people are going for. So we're talking pre-workouts, protein powders, post-workouts, things like that. Stepping forward now, what drives you to release a new supplement? You know, what is it that you look for when you're uh, choosing to enter a certain category of the market? Um, well, there's obviously just market demand and uh, competition. If, if there's low demand, low competition, we're less inclined. If it's a higher demand, higher competition uh, category, then we're more interested in it. And then also, how well do I feel I understand the people who are buying it and how good of a fit is it for uh, our existing customers and the, the stuff that they want to buy? Like, for example, we were toying with the idea of doing an, an endurance supplement, an intro workout, but specifically for endurance. Unfortunately, there's nothing, we can't figure any, figure out anything special or interesting 
to do with an intra workout for weightlifters uh, because often those are just BCAA products and BCAA products are worthless. And even though we're asked every week to, to create a BCAA product from people who even know that they're worthless, people will say, I know that <laughs> BCAAs don't do anything. I just like to drink tasty water. And I would, if you had a BCAA, I would give you the money instead of this other company. Um, <laughs> but that's not a good enough reason to make a product, right? Right. And uh, so, so we were looking at doing an intro workout for endurance uh, athletes in particular, because there are some things you can do there, but I decided not to because one, I don't, that's, uh, that's kind of a world unto itself. And it's, uh, that's uh, a market that I don't really understand. I haven't been a part of it personally. Um, I've, I've been in the body composition space since the beginning. And so I understand that market well, I understand the people well, I understand their, their needs and their problems. Endurance is, is different. I, I look at it almost like, I mean, not, not in the same way, but if you want to get into the vegan market, it's not as simple as just making a vegan product and saying, Hey, I have a vegan product, buy it. And, um, so that, so we, and I know that a lot of my, uh, customers and my best customers are more body composition people. They're not hardcore endurance athletes. And so they wouldn't spend extra money and you know, maybe, maybe, you know, for them, quote unquote, uh, endurance training is cardio, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, they, they might, they might do some cardio even regularly. They might go ride their bike and, or, or run or whatever, but they just kind of view it as cardio and they're not going to be spending 30 or $40 a month so they can be a little bit faster in their cardio sessions. They just right. don't care. Um, so that's an example of something where I know there's demand and there's a very, very high competition, but I've intentionally stayed away from it. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's really, that's really, uh, there's, there's not, uh, and, and that might be, that might be to our detriment, but so far the products that we've made, I guess also have been pretty obvious where there were just obvious things that if you're going to have a very well-rounded offering of sports nutrition supplements, then you should have a fish oil. You should have a joint supplement. You should have a pre-workout, post-workout. You should have uh, at least a couple different options for protein, a whey protein, um, a casein protein, uh, even, I mean, we have a, we have a, a plant protein as well. What we don't have is an egg protein, which we may do. So I would say up until now, it's been pretty easy. Uh, it's just been doing the obvious things, mm -hmm. uh, but going forward, it's going to get trickier. Like we have an immunity, like an immunity boosting supplement that's coming out soon. And I'm curious to see how that does. Um, it, I don't expect it to do tremendously well, but I know there's definitely a demand for it and it, it is a great product and the formulation is pretty unique. And so I'm, I'm personally excited for it. Again, a lot of this is scratching my own itch anyway. Um, <laughs> but, but we'll see, we'll see how it, we'll see how it does. And going forward, we are going to do an energy drink, for example, and very crowded market, very competitive. But I do know that at least a lot of my customers and again, a lot of my best customers, which means also a lot of customers in the future, a lot of other people like them, do like having the option of of either, you know, whether it's, so they might have some pre-workout caffeine and then they wanna have a little bit more later in the day and maybe they want coffee, maybe they want an energy drink, they like to have that option. And again, we can we can do something cool with the, with an energy drink a bit unique, spend a bit more money than our, than, than our competitors basically and come up with a formulation that is, uh, is better than, uh, bangs, fake super creatine <laughs> and, and BCAAs basically, you know, but Hey, it's got a study behind it. I mean, it, it, surely that study wasn't in any way, uh, biased, you know, influenced no. or biased no. or anything. Could it be? No, no, no. <laughs> you know how that here, here's how stuff like that works. If you fund it, they will find it there. That's how that works. Yes. There I'm, I, I'm glad you brought up the energy drink category for a couple of reasons. Um, so there is a, a friend of ours that they know that I, I do some stuff in the supplement industry. And so they have, they, I get fielded questions and I'm sure you get the same thing. People know that you do stuff in health and fitness. And so you get bombarded with questions. And so this individual is buying some fat loss supplements from an MLM company and he also said that he's been using bang energy drinks throughout the day. He said, man, my dinner last night was a protein bar and a bang. And I just, I know these BCAAs and the, the CoQ10 and the 
thing. And my initial reaction was, you know, bang, you know, at the 300 milligrams of caffeine, that's, that's going to help suppress your appetite and give you energy. He said, but no, it's more than that. It's got BCAAs and CoQ10 and super creatine, and he's down 15 pounds. So, you know, you walk that fine line. Do you want to, you know, crush his hopes and dreams and the excitement he's got of losing the 15 pounds to tell him that, that energy? Well, no, you can, you can just save him. Yeah, you can just save him the money because you're like, well, the reason you're losing the weight is the calorie deficit, my friend. And caffeine might be helping a little bit with that, but not much. Once you become sensitized to it, it's fat burning effects more or less disappear. So yeah, it's still, it still can, it still can reduce appetite. But uh, if you, if you, if you like expensive and tasty caffeine, then you can keep doing the bang. Or if uh, you want to save some money, you could just do caffeine pills. But you may want to also rethink that altogether because getting good sleep is is more important than the, again, negligible, but negligible benefits that a little bit of caffeine, well, I guess it's a fair amount of caffeine, is going to provide in terms of fat burning. Correct. Um, now, with the energy drink, most I would say the vast majority of all energy drinks on the markets are prop blends. Uh, and I know Legion has a history of doing everything transparently dosed. Are y'all going to make the energy drink transparently labled as well with all yeah, the absolutely. flavorings and yeah, additives yeah, no, and all we'll, that? We'll never, we'll never use prop blends. Fantastic. I just don't, yeah, I just don't see why we ever would. Yeah, naturally sweetened with stevia and uh, maybe some sugar alcohols like the other products. Yeah, exactly. And we, we can look at, there are some other natural alter, alternatives that we haven't been able to use in in products, mainly because they're not sweet enough and they're too expensive. There are some interesting things out there, allulose, um, monk fruit, mm -hmm. but stevia and erythritol are very sweet and um, more cost efficient. And so, you know, we, we stick to those. But even speaking to that point, naturally sweetening products is very expensive. In 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 some cases, and with some of my products, I mean, I'm spending up to five dollars a bottle just for the flavor system, which of course includes is mostly it's mostly driven by the the sweetener. Whereas uh, if I were to go artificial, I mean, literally that five dollar flavor system would drop to like fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's absurd how much – even – and natural colors are the same way too. If you want to use like beetroot powder or turmeric for coloring yep. and stuff, it's it's absurdly expensive to do it the natural way. But you know, I would prefer to see the industry head more that way. Yeah, I mean it, it's – I'd say it's it's happening. It's happening slowly but surely. It's definitely moving in that direction. And again, it if, and I and I talk about this over over on the website. I, I'm not one for alarmism about artificial sweeteners, and I'm not one to say that having a couple servings of artificial sweeteners per day is going to screw up your gut and screw up your health. But if you take the average person who's let's say they're they're into working out. And they have a few scoops of protein per day. They have a couple scoops, maybe a serving of, of pre-workout and post-workout. Then also they like their BCAs, so they drink those too. That might even be several servings a day. Let's say one to three servings of BCAs a day. You're getting up there actually in terms of those were all artificially sweetened. You could easily be putting down seven to 10 servings of artificial sweeteners per day or more because some people also take the, they, they, they chew artificially, artificially sweetened gum as well. And they get it through other, through other food products or other supplements and doing that consistently over time is almost certainly not good for your health. Not that it's going to wreck your health, but it's not good for your health and probably is having some negative effects on your gut, which then can, ripple out into your body in many different ways. So that's why I personally just, I'm not, uh, I, I don't like go out of my way to never have artificial sweeteners. Like if somebody has some, uh, some gum in the office, usually I'll take some and chew a little bit. I don't really, it's not that big of a deal, but I, I do generally keep my intake very low or, or really, really at zero because I don't really care to have a bunch of highly sweetened things that uh, beyond my beyond just my my supplements, which I'd say are fairly sweet. It's hard to get it's hard to get to the sickening level of sweetness in, that you, that you get with many supplements if you go natural. Uh, but that's why I, that's why I chose to go natural, just because I think that I think it's a smart decision. I don't think it's that big of a deal because, uh, especially as in, in the case of Legion, as we've 
graduated to better and better flavor labs over the years. And we have some really good people that we work with now. I think our stuff tastes pretty good. And you're never going to get to the deliciousness of, of at least with some flavors that you can get to with artificial flavors and artificial sweeteners. But I think we do a, a pretty good job for, for being hundred percent natural where a lot of the stuff, we get a lot of good feed, feedback. People are, people enjoy drinking it and maybe they would, as far as palatability goes, enjoy artificially sweetened and artificially flavored stuff a little bit more. But so long as you enjoy drinking something, is it really that big of a deal? Like we're talking about, you know, eight ounces of water, you drink it down, you're like, oh, that tasted good and you're done, right? Correct. Yeah. I, I've tried the, I haven't tried the current iteration of Pulse, but I did the previous iteration, uh, all six flavors. And it's the, at the time it was still ahead of the, the, the pack as far as stevia sweetened products. I'm not a huge fan of, of stevia sweetened products in general just because they usually have that kind of little tang or afterbite to it. But that one was noticeably less. Um, and so it's, I'd, and I'm sure that the new flavor is even better than that now. Yeah, yeah, we we have improved uh, on what you had quite a bit uh, again because we found a new lab that does really really good work. They they have a lot of experience with natural sweeteners and natural flavoring in particular, and that's what you need because a lot of this stuff is it's like a mystical art. It's not a science. You can't you, you can't you can't just go to school for for food flavoring or supplement flavoring. You are really mentored by uh, you know you have to yeah you know, if you get to work under somebody who's really good and they teach you the ways like that's then you're now really good, and so uh, it can be it can be very hit and miss. It's there it's it's there isn't a like a clear kind of standardized expectation that you can have when you're working with flavor labs so much so that there was, I remember there's a story, there's, there's a guy who apparently he's like the grand wizard of flavoring. He came up with the country. He did all the flavoring for, uh, the, uh, country time lemonade. And so this dude is a multimillionaire from, cause he gets royalties apparently on, on all of that stuff that's sold. And he's that good that he can demand royalties and he wow. really doesn't work. He doesn't work with anybody anymore. He doesn't care. He's made so much money from country time lemonade. And I guess that was like his final, uh, grand slam, but he, he hit some home runs along the way as well. I forget which ones, but, um, th that's just an example of, of he, he's the guy. And it, probably it's similar to like sommeliers because it requires, it's not just a, you have to have uh, the right tasting. It's probably even comes down to some genetic uh, advantages mm -hmm. that some physical, physiological advantages of being able to like, I, <laughs> this, these random stories are coming back to me. So um, there was that, that guy was working on something. I don't remember some, some drink of some kind. And uh, he would just, Apparently he, he could even just smell something and, and know like something's off. Like he'd smell whatever they gave him. He'd be like, no, nah, it needs more banana. <laughs> and, and yeah. So what, what is that dude? That's, <laughs> That's the next level. Uh, yeah, no, I, you, you can't, yeah, you can't learn that. I'm sorry. Fascinating. Um, so you just mentioned that y'all are getting ready to enter the energy drink market. Another, uh, incredibly competitive market that we're seeing a lot of brands enter into is the protein bar market. And Legion recently released their own take on it. Um, what do you think separates yours from the other ones on the market? And why did you decide to enter that in the first place? Well, it's, I'd say what sets us apart is similar to what sets us apart in, in any category, really. And that comes down to the amount of money that we spend on our products. I mean, my cost of goods hovers around 50 to 60% of revenue. And part of that is because we do a lot of sales on Amazon, but part of that is just because my products are very expensive. Mm -hmm. Uh, the margins are by business standards, not good. Like on average, my, my markup is only, uh, I'm only doubling whatever it costs me. So like my protein, my whey protein, my whey plus costs me $19 a bottle to make and I sell it for 40. And so that into to people who are maybe not initiated in business, they go, Oh, that's, that's really good. No, it's not by business standards. Good is 
I'd say five times markup from manufacturing, man, the cost of manufacturing to the MSRP is considered okay. Mm -hmm. That's like, if you're just selling widgets for profit, you maybe shouldn't even bother with that. You want to look for eight times, that's good. Eight times is considered solid. Um, Ten times plus is very good. Now, that's be one of the reasons why that is because there are wholesalers, right, for example, that, that they, they need their cut. And so we don't work with wholesalers. We're just direct consumer. Um, so in the case of the protein bars, the, the, we, they, we sell them for $30 a box, I think. And they cost about half that. That's what they cost me. And so what that means, though, is I am able to use high-quality protein, so whey protein isolate, whey concentrate, whey hydrolysate, and there's also some pea protein as well. Um, and it's mostly whey. It's about, I want to say, 18, 19 grams of uh, whey protein and, um, and, a, and a few grams of pea, mostly just because it adds a nice texture to it. Right. And and that was, you know, in working with the, um, with, with the manufacturer, it's, it's kind of interesting actually, because like then it's, they consider, so they call it a recipe. Right. And I had to go back and forth with them just to make sure that, cause they, they want it to be proprietary to them is, is what they want. They don't want, they don't want me to be able to go elsewhere and work with anybody else. And so what they were used to is they were used to companies coming to them and actually not caring and just being like, yeah, whatever, just make me a bar that tastes good. And I just want to be able to claim 20 grams of protein per bar. I actually don't care what type of protein it is. I don't care what quality of protein it is. Do your thing. Right. Yikes. And, oh yeah. That's, that's the normal, but that's the normal with, with any product. You don't know how many, like in so many cases, supplement companies, they just go to a manufacturer and say, Hey, I want to do a pre-workout. Like, let's say you have some Instagram influencer, right? Some dude or some chick that has a couple million followers and they're just like, eh, it's time to cash in. Let's make some supplements, go to manufacturer. Yeah. Make me a pre-workout. Just make it good. I don't I don't know anything about this stuff. I don't care whatever. Right. Uh, and I, so I, I need the cost to be $7 a bottle, no more than $7. That's all I care about. Right. And they go, oh, yeah, sure. Here we have this off the shelf formulation. It's really good. Um, and they go, yeah, yeah, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> Again, that, like, that's that's actually the process, uh, generally speaking. And so in the beginning, even with with the products, the manufacturers I was working with were they thought it was cool that I really did care. And I was very specific about what I wanted and what even what like types of ingredients I wanted. And in some cases, they needed to be special types that were that had standardized amounts of very specific molecules that deliver all the benefits. And, um, and they that were on one hand, were, were, were thought they thought it's it's it's, it's, it's nice to see on the other hand, kind of a pain in the ass because no, they weren't just weren't used to having to work that hard for quoting. Mm -hmm. Uh, cause some of the ingredients are actually kind of hard to find. Like if you want some generic junk version of the ingredient, yeah, no problem. Oh, you want like a good one that is standardized or you want a patented one? Uh, not as easy. Um, anyway, so in the, in the case of the protein bar, there's the way in the pea protein, we also included a uh, healthy prebiotic fiber, which is, if people aren't familiar with that, that's soluble fiber, right? Mm -hmm. So stuff that's, that's found in, in fruits and vegetables and that's very good for your gut. So we have, uh, I believe it's 10 grams per bar in the form of chicory, chicory root and soluble corn fiber. And there are even specific reasons why we chose those. And I, I share this information on the website. Um, and so in the end, really, it just comes down to high quality protein, 20 grams per bar, naturally sweetened and flavored, uh, which adds a fair amount of, um, uh, cost per bar mm -hmm. and then good carbs, not, not just maltodextrin or, uh, or other junk carbs that you can throw into a bar and no fake net carbs, um, shenanigans either, which I believe that that's, that's over now, right? Because I think pro, I think quest got sued for that and then they had to stop. Yeah. And they've also been some other labeling guidelines. And so most of the people that are using the, uh, IMO fiber syrup or the Vita fiber syrup is they've started listing it out or just removing the fiber, uh, that fake fiber number in there yeah, yeah, altogether. Yeah. 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 Oh, you just mentioned about cashing in the, the Insta famous people cashing in for their big paydays. Um, you've built up a considerable following and at any time you could have, you know, sold out, you know, just said, screw it. I've got my millions. I've made my money. I've left my mark on the industry. It's time to cash out. 
How, what has kept you level-headed and prevented you from just selling out and hawking the, the latest, you know, fad or ke exogenous ketones or BCAAs or anything like that? Yeah, collagen protein. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's another yeah. one too. P partnering with Goop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's just a matter of... I'm going to sound like a politician. It's a matter of integrity for me. It's a matter of personal ethics. I, I just don't agree with it whatsoever. And it's not worth, I can, I can make plenty of money doing it the honest way. So why not? And if I were to sell out, um, and this, this goes, this is like a, a different discussion, a deeper discussion though, of like something that, um, is, is generally just important to me is that I'm, I'm very interested in the type of person that I am and the type of person that I'm being. And that comes down to my behaviors and so, and my values. And so if I were to do that, it would be so at odds with my values that have not, that supersede just business or I mean, this business or just business in general, it would be, it would be so contrary to what I believe is right and how I believe people should behave that the cognitive dissonance would, would fuck me up. Um, I, you know, I, I, it'd be hard for me to imagine a scenario where I would, where I would do it. I mean, even if, even if let's say things got rough and I really needed money, there are plenty of honest ways to make a lot of money quickly. It requires a lot of work. It's not as easy as just lying or being a scammer, but there are, if you're a creative person and you have a good imagination and you're not afraid to work hard and you know how to market well, and that doesn't mean dishonestly, you can be a good marketer and be completely honest and transparent. It's just salesmanship and, you know, persuasion and being able to use those things to sell in an honest way, then you, you can, you can, you can make millions of dollars. And maybe I would have made money faster if I would have sold out. But in the long run, and that's also maybe another element of my personality is I tend to have a very low time preference, meaning like a longer time horizon. I'm very much more interested in the future and what I'm doing now and how it's going to impact the future and how it's going to come back to me in the future than what I'm doing now. And so if I were a high time preference person who was just addicted to instant gratification, then yeah, then I would have had more of an incentive to just sell out. And by selling out, just to, to make it very uh, clear, really all, all, it, all it would have meant is, is cutting my cogs in half, <laughs> just making stuff that's not as good. Right. And, uh, and, and I probably still could have experienced a lot of growth because if I would have done it in a sneaky way, in an intelligent way, it would have been hard to just outright call me out for it. Uh, but there could have been plenty of things that really what it, what it, what it would have resulted in is millions of um, additional dollars that, that would be in my pocket right now. And so eventually though, I, I just believe that you can't go around, um, treating people other than in ways other than you'd want to be treated and you can't go around harming other people and, and harming just, just the world around you. And that is harmful. I believe it's harmful to lie to people, to sell them junk pills and powders. Uh, is it as harmful as many other things that, that, that could be done to them? No, but it's still harmful. And so you only can do that so much before it all comes crashing down. And I've, I've seen that many times actually over the years, um, just knowing people who at one point in their lives had, were making a bunch of money, quote unquote, doing well, but doing it in very dishonest ways. And it was just and then eventually seeing the, the crash and burn. It doesn't always happen, but I've seen it a number of times. And so I think that's especially, I would be especially likely to happen when you know what you're doing is wrong. It's one thing if you're so deluded or um, just so inherently criminal that you truly believe what you're doing is right and you can get into the whole greatest good rationalization. If you're into that, if you're into like the end justifies the means, mm -hmm. then uh, it's very easy to justify just about anything actually. If you have 
any sort of IQ. You can you can justify a lot of things just using that 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 way of thinking. Correct. And uh, so in, in but if, if if you know though, every time you know if 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 when somebody comments about maybe something maybe not talking about you but what you are doing, and you get that kind of sinking feeling in your stomach because you know that that's that's not what you want to hear. You know it's true. You know that's what you're doing. Uh, it's, you, you will get what you deserve and eventually. So I intentionally didn't want to put myself in that position going into it. And so that's why first and foremost, I was like, we're going to make good stuff and we're going to sell it. Honestly, we're going to, we're not going to overhype things and we're not going to promise benefits that are, uh, even unlikely, like we're going to go with weight of the evidence, good evidence. And of course these are natural products, so they will work for some people and not for others. That's the case with creatine, for example, which is the most studied molecule in all of sports nutrition, but some people just don't respond to it and that's okay. And, and that, that's just the way it is. Right. And so by doing that, uh, you know, yeah, I've made less money from selling supplements, but I have preserved my self, uh, respect and that's worth more than, than millions of dollars. Honestly, it is. Yeah. You can put your head down at night and, and rest comfortably knowing that you haven't, you haven't sold that and you've maintained your integrity. Yeah. And that, and, and see, that sounds kind of cliche. Uh, and, and I understand there are people out there who would be skeptical of that because you know, if you have financial problems and I've had financial problems in the past, I know what that's like and it sucks. It's, it's something that is always weighing on you. And you'd think that taking that burden off, like, yeah, whatever, you know, so what you, you lie, you're not entirely honest. You also, know, you can get into like euphemistic thinking and where you're not, you're not lying. You're just being economical with the truth. <laughs> uh, you know, again, pol, pol, you get into the political, the, yep. poli, the poli, politician mindset. And then you think that it, that if you could trade the, the stress that you have, the financial stress that you're feeling every day for some sort of existential angst over maybe, you know, saying some things you shouldn't say to sell some stuff that's not bad. It's just not as good as you're saying. I can understand why people are like, nah, I'll, I'll, I'll just, just, just give me the, give me the, the easy road out and um, I'll figure out how to deal with it. But again, I've seen it's that shit eats away at you. It just eats away at you and, and you just become a shittier and shittier person. I've seen it a number of times over the years. And, uh, I, to, again, to where I'm like, I just don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to go down that road because, uh, I, it would be stupid for me to think that it wouldn't happen to me. And that's that outlier thinking that, that also people tend to fall into where, you know, take any, take any sort of negative behavior that is repeated over and over and over, even if it's something simple smoking. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then thinking like, well, yeah, all the, all the increased risks of all these diseases, that's not going to happen to me. You know, I'm an outlier is what they're saying. Right. Like, no, statistically you're not, maybe you are, but if you're going to, if you're going to take that position, you need to start with the assumption that you're not because the, the, the base rate probability is that you're not, that you're right in the middle of the bell curve. Same thing with me and everybody, no matter what we're looking at. So if we're now going to argue why we are an outlier in any regard, we need to make a case for that. Not just, well, I feel like I am like, okay, that's not, that's that, that's not a, where, where's the evidence, so to speak, that you're an outlier. Now in that case, we're like, oh, well, I took this genetic test and I have, um, uh, amazing detox pathways and I have no genetic risks for cancer and, uh, blah, blah, blah. And, then, and then at least you go, all right, well, actually genetically you are an outlier in that <laughs> regard. Good for you. But of course it never goes that far. Right. And so now we're talking about something that's more, uh, almost spiritual in a sense that, so how, how are you going to say like, well, yeah, you know, being, being a shyster might eat away at other people and, and turn them into, uh, Scrooge McDuck, but it won't happen to me because I'm just different. Okay. <laughs> Would you say the, the way that your parents raised you had a, a key determining factor in how you, uh, built yourself and your company's ethics? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Without a doubt. Um, because 
my, yeah, my parents are just good people. And, and my dad in particular, not that he's like a better person than my mom, but as my dad, you know, he obviously served as a role model and he, he's just your kind of, uh, archetypal good guy, like truly just a good guy. Mm-hmm. And, and he has, I've always seen him operate like this in his business and in his life. And, that's not to say he hasn't made mistakes. He's definitely made mistakes. Ironically, some of the bigger mistakes that I've seen him make in business, at least, are on the side of being too generous and letting people take advantage of him. Um, but growing up, obviously, in a household like that, where um, personal ethics is valued and talked about and and lived out, mm-hmm. um, where there was... Um, even I would say there wasn't even like my parents never, I can't, I don't even know if I've ever even, even seen them drink alcohol before just cause they're not into it. Not that, uh, it, it wasn't for like religious reasons or anything. It's yeah. just, they just never got into it. My dad, when he was in college and he was younger, he definitely was into it, but, uh, he just, I don't know, he just gave it up, I guess, um, maybe as when I, when I came around or something. And so certainly, certainly that helped and it, it helped in that not only did it, obviously it, there's a subconscious influence there that, you know, just kind of impresses, um, patterns of behavior into, as a parent, you, 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 you're going to influence your kid's behavior, whether they realize it or not. But it also showed that it's actually a viable way to live. It's not a sucker's way to live. It's not, the world is not, you know, get them before they get you or, uh, suppress or be suppressed. Right. And, uh, it's not every man out for himself and, uh, it's, it's there. I saw that it is possible to like treat again, uh, treat consumers, treat your customers well and treat them the way that you would like to be treated and take care of them. And they will reward you with not just their, uh, support in the way of money, but also word of mouth and goodwill. And, and that stuff is worth a lot. It's, you can't, you, you can't buy that actually. You can, you can buy customers through advertising and you, and it's, it's, it's expensive, but you can't buy goodwill and you can't buy word of mouth. You have to earn those things. And if you do though, that contributes far more value to, to a business than, than just paid advertising. So, um, yeah, that's, I guess my answer to that. (laughs) That's that's perfect. That's very insightful. Um, as a family man yourself, you you have a wife and, and two small children, how do you juggle managing multiple successful businesses while still uh, being present at home and trying to set that good example for your own kids? That's a good question. The honest answer is, although it's a little bit better now, uh, in the beginning, I just worked. I wasn't around very much. There wasn't much work-life balance. It was really just work. I mean, I would work uh, every every, let's say, Monday through Thursday, mostly from basically the morning until the night throw in a couple breaks for food and to do some cardio if I was cutting. And if I was eating dinner, it'd be with my wife and uh, first came my, my son. Uh, but, and then Friday night, usually I wasn't working. Um, so Sarah and I would do something Saturday. I would work all day and Saturday night we might do something. And then Sunday I would work in the morning and I would in the afternoon either do something with Sarah or, or go play golf. And I was golfing for about a year, year and a half. I was going consistently for, um, yeah, once a week for the afternoon, which in this, that actually, I found that, uh, nice to, it was nice to, get a, to do something other than work and to just get outside and be my, be by myself for a little bit. That mm-hmm. was actually, it was like a little bit of almost therapeutic. It sounds maybe kind of selfish given what my schedule was like, but, uh, I felt like there actually was value in that. And that the time that I was spending with Sarah was probably actually a little bit better because I was, I had a little bit of time every week to just do something that was outside and by myself and nobody didn't, nobody needed anything from me and whatever. Right. Um, so that was the case for, for a number of years. And, and then my daughter was born a couple of years ago and I, um, 
I'm trying to think exactly when that transition occurred, but sometime in the last two to three years, I've ratcheted back a little bit, but not too much. So if I speak to now, just where am I at right now is I'm still working, you know, I'll get home between seven and 8 PM, uh, from the office on weekdays. And from there it's make myself some food, help put my son Lennox to bed. So he usually needs some food while my, while my wife is putting our daughter to bed and she usually takes a little bit longer to get in bed. She's two and get to sleep and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, so that, that eats up a fair amount of time. So I'm not like, you know, there, I'm not at home at 5 PM to, for the sit down dinner and, you know, hour and a half with the kids and, and wife. Um, it's kind of a rush like, okay, I'm cooking my food. I'm making Lennox food. Um, if he needs a shower, I give him a shower, take a shower with him, clean him, whatever, put him in bed, brush his teeth. So by the time all the, both Sarah and my chores, so to speak, are done, it's like usually, 9 p.m., maybe 8.30, and we go to bed at 10. So we have a little bit of time at the end of the night um, to, to spend with each other. And if I also, though, like it needs to be something relaxing. Like if we have sex, that's good. That's relaxing. If, <laughs> if we, if we have like a set of like chill kind of conversation about something, I honestly, it's not about, it's not a matter of like fighting or not. Uh, we don't fight very much. Like we sure will have fights here and there and disagreements and arguments, but, um, it's more like even if it's a if it's in a stimulating conversation for me, if it requires my uh, brain to really work, then chances are it's going to mess with my sleep. And I've considered I've, I've actually experienced that enough now where uh, if I if I don't go to bed in kind of a relaxed, sleepy ish state chance, I'm not going to have any trouble falling asleep, but I'm going to probably wake up uh, multiple times in the middle of the night. And for me to have a good night's sleep, I need to have powered down, so to speak. And so, um, so that's like really the end of the night is Sarah and I spend some time together and, and just kind of power down after, after the day. And, uh, and then on the weekends I, I take Saturdays, I'll work in the morning and then, uh, mornings and then do something with my family in the afternoons, Sunday work in the mornings and either do something with them in the afternoon or go play golf in the afternoon. So some people would, would hear that and be like that. That's that, that life's not for me. That doesn't, you know, that's, that's not a balanced life. Mm -hmm. And I understand, but I don't really believe in work-life balance. I don't think there is any way to balance everything that, you know, you, let's say you have, you have your health, you have your family, you have your work, you have your friends. Those are like the main buckets, right? Mm -hmm. You can't, you, you can't have them all. Um, you just can't because taking care of yourself, for example, health, it requires getting enough sleep. Let's start there. I make sure that I'm in bed for eight hours a night. That wasn't the case in the past because I used to be a superstar sleeper who would fall asleep in like five minutes, blackout unconscious for like six and a half hours, wake up and be totally fine. And that was just rinse, repeat every day for like six years. But now I tend to wake up once or twice at night and I need to make sure that I'm getting enough sleep. So for me to get up at 6 a.m. when I get up, I have to be in bed at 10. Okay. So that already puts a limitation on what am I going to be up to, especially on weekdays. And then health means exercising. It means three to five hours a week, ideally, of exercise for just everybody and whatever you do. I mean, there are better and worse things you can do, but there, if you're getting some sort of exercise, you're doing a good job if you're doing it regularly. And so that takes time. Um, and if you're going to eat good food, that also takes a bit of time. It probably means you're going to be preparing your own meals, which I do as well. And I bring like, I bring my lunch to the office and work takes a lot. If you're going to really get somewhere, um, whether it's building a business, especially if it's building a business, but even building a career and in you're, you're going to try to do it on with a nine to five mentality. Good luck. Just good luck. I mean, maybe you, you again, we're looking, if we look at it in terms of a bell curve, uh, the vast majority of the people who have, and we look at it like on the, the, the horizontal, uh, axis is, is number of hours worked per week and achieved some significant level of success. The middle of the bell curve is it's, it's a number probably ranging from 60 to 80 hours per week, uh, at least, especially in the beginning when you're getting something off the ground. And then once you have, something successful. It's up to you in terms of, do you want to let off the gas a little bit and not work as much knowing that it probably will slow down your growth. 
or are you a very type A person who you're just like, nah, I just want to keep going and okay, then you, you just know what the, that time commitment looks like. And, and, and then family, same thing, right. And, and friends. And so for me, like I have no social life and I'm fine with that. I actually don't care. Like I don't hang out with friends. I work with my friends. I'm fortunate to like all the guys I work with and, um, in the office, in the office is just guys. We have, we have some women working with us, but they're, they're, they're remote. It just kind of worked out that way. Um, but you know, the, I, I count all these guys as friends and our time together is really here in the office. But outside of that, uh, if someone wants to come golf with me on a Sunday afternoon, Hey, welcome. They're welcome to come. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm not hanging out on a Tuesday night with friends or a Wednesday or Thursday or often even a Friday night. And I'm totally fine with that. And that's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make in the future. I'll probably feel differently about that in the future. I probably will consciously go, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to turn down that work burner a little bit so I can turn up this friends burner and have a bit more of a bit more social interaction in my life. But, um, so the idea again, that you can, you can have it all. No, you can't, you just can't, <laughs> you can't re recount, hearing you recount your, your typical week or day is, I was nodding pretty much constantly through that because that is your schedule is very much akin to the way my wife and I schedule is with our, our toddler and all that. And the amount of hours I'm working through the day. So it, it's nice to know that, uh, there's more than just me out there that's doing something similar. <laughs> That's I mean, maintaining the, that kind of schedule. It, it is the only way. And I mean, there's even not that this is one of those things we don't need science to tell us this, but there's 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 quite a bit of research on this. It's in the way mostly of surveys, but that just how much successful entrepreneurs in particular are working. And even even CEOs who are often demonized as like, you know, um, lazy fat cats who just sit around smoking cigars and counting their money, which is just really ironic. You have to be so ignorant to actually think that. And, you know, the one there's there's like research out there. You could go look into what your average CEO of a big company, uh, what their what their life looks like and and. Two, you could also, well, I mean, maybe depending on what circles you run and maybe you're not meeting these people, but in, in my travels, I've met quite a few people and they're, so take, take what we're doing and then add a bunch of travel on top of it as well. And that's like your average CEO of a big company. And yeah, they might be making millions of dollars a year, but their entire life revolves around that job. And they're often not at home. They can't, they don't even have the option to like put their son to bed because, uh, half of every month they're, they're uh, out of town and traveling. So, um, yeah, that's just, that's just the reality. And I've, I've said this to, to people who reach out to me asking about getting, should they get into business for themselves? And one of the, one of the criteria is, uh, if, if you can't comfortably work at least 50 hours a week. And that means work, not on the computer with like five social media sites open and your phone dinging and maybe the TV on as well. And that's, and then you're, you're, you're quote unquote multitasking on maybe your email or something, right? No, that's not working. I mean, true uh, focused work. Now, maybe it's not going to be 50 hours of, of what Cal Newport would call deep work. Uh, I'm not even sure I could do that where you are really, it requires all of your focus, all of your concentration. Writing is a good example of that. Mm -hmm. It really requires a lot of focus and concentration. Doing anything creative really is a good example of that. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't think I, I actually could do that. Or if, if I, if I were to do that, the quality would, would certainly decline probably after five or six hours in any given day. So, okay, but you have your deep work, but then you have your, your more shallow work that just has to get done. Like take email and take all the just random logistical things that go into running a business and the, the meetings you inevitably have to have, uh, and, and, and just all the stuff that, 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 that goes into, um, a, a job even. It doesn't even have to be building a business. And so I, what I've told people is um, if you can't comfortably do that for at least 50 hours a week, at least, that's a bare minimum, I would say you should be able to, to push yourself north of 80 hours before you start feeling like, uh, wow, that's a I'm working a lot these days, <laughs> <laughs> then, then, then don't do it. Don't get into business unless you have some soup, unless you have like the next Snapchat or something, then fine. The, the, you won the lottery and, and the, and the markets will, will carry you to, to riches. But if, if, again, if it's like most people, this is a business that is going to have to, you're just going to have to grind into existence. Um, you have to be able 
to do a lot of work and a lot of high quality work. Excellent. Awesome, Mike. Well, uh, I know we're coming up against our, uh, our time deadline here. So, uh, you know, I'd like to get you back on the show in a couple of weeks possible because I'd like to really delve into uh, your writing style and some of the challenges that come along with that, some of the enjoyment that comes with that and uh, give listeners an insight into that uh, as well. Yeah, so, that's uh, fun. That's actually something that I haven't spoken about much just because I haven't thought to really like monologue about it on my podcast and nobody has, well, maybe not nobody, but I'm rarely asked about it. So, yeah, I think it'd be a wonderful, uh, opportunity to gain some insight into that. So, uh, I'm sure everybody knows where to find you cause you're, you're fairly prominent in the industry, but go ahead and do the, uh, the sales pitch spiel for Legion and yourself. <laughs> Let me uh, get my, my Billy Mays voice going. Um, no, I just, you can find me at legionathletics.com. That that's really the central hub now. You, you, for for anyone who's still listening, uh, you heard Muscle for Life, and that was a website that I had that I eventually merged into Legion because it just didn't really make sense to have two different websites. And so Legion, that means now Legion has not only the the supplements, but it also has a, we have a coaching service with about 500 or so active clients, a lot of really good success stories. We work with men and women of all ages and circumstances, um, all levels of fitness, and really do a good job. It's a very VIP kind of hands-on high touch service. We have pre-made meal plans for um, losing weight, for gaining weight. Uh, we have a custom meal plan service. I also have a ton of free content. I have probably a thousand articles now published at Legion's blog because Legion got all of Muscle for Life's articles. So Legion had, it's maybe not a thousand, maybe it's like 800 or so, but hundreds and hundreds of long form, well-written, well-researched articles on probably anything you could really want to know at this point re regarding how to improve your body composition, and your health. My podcast now lives over at Legion. It's still called the Muscle for Life podcast, but we just have now a section of the website so people can find it and listen to, uh, listen to episodes on the site if they want. You know, it, most people obviously just use whatever software they use to, to listen to podcasts. Um, and we have some other neat stuff coming. Like we're going to be doing another podcast, a different podcast. Uh, it's not going to be me. I'm going to be working with, I'm going to be working on it behind the scenes, but I'd like to build out almost like a media network, uh, produce other, other, other podcasts just because I like the, the medium. And I think there are some interesting opportunities and we're also working on what we're going to call it sounds a little bit cheesy and pretentious, but I, I haven't thought of anything better yet is Academy, like uh, Legion Academy. And what, what that's really going to be is it's going to be more of a deep dive into the first. It's going to be the science of supplementation. So think examine.com, but more user friendly, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and anybody who's familiar with examine, I'm sure appreciates the level of detail and the amount of technical information that's there. But if you're not a scientist, most of it is is it's incomprehensible actually. Correct. <laughs> and yeah. so, I mean, it is right. And so I have on who working with me, the, the, the former found co-founder and lead researcher and writer of examine, uh, Curtis Frank is his name. He works with me. And so he, everything that you see on examine, basically the, all the technical deep dive stuff was researched and written by Curtis. And so we're going to be putting together a database, so to speak, of information that um, is going to be more accessible and it's going to be easier for just laymen to understand some of the deeper mechanisms of how the, how different supplements work. And so, um, yeah, those are those are some of the some of the stuff that we have, some of the some of the projects that we have in the in the pipeline that I'm excited about, in addition to new products, of course, and new flavors and stuff. But um, that's fun of course, but I, I also, I, I like all the educational stuff that we're doing. So I tend to talk about that more, maybe sometimes to, uh, to, to the detriment of sales. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's why I started this podcast was for consumer education about the science of supplements in the first place. So I'm glad there's, there's more people out there like that, that are doing this. And it's, a uh, it's been a real pleasure to talk today, man. And uh, I'd like to get you back on the podcast soon and, uh, Curtis as well. Yeah. Yeah. Please do, um, reach out, uh, you know, we'll be in touch via email. I know you're speaking with Roman, so let's set it up. Awesome. Great. Well then thanks so much, Mike. And, uh, have a great day. Okay. You too.